Hi, this is Bill Joyce, and I'm the broker at Charter Home in Sacramento and a blogger at survivingtheamericandream.org. While I'm an advocate for home ownership in general, I've seen the kind of pain and suffering a poor home choice can have on a family's finances, marriage, health, and overall happiness. I believe the oversold and underdefined image of dream home encourages people to spend far too much money for the wrong kinds of things. Buying a house doesn't get you the life you imagine or the time to live it any more than joining a gym will make you fit. It takes discipline and effort to create the things you dream of. You can't simply buy them. Join me while I interview experts in various fields like financial planning, marriage and family therapy, career counselors, life coaches, as well as happy and unhappy homeowners willing to share their hard-earned wisdom. Why don't you go ahead and tell us just a little bit about you and uh, the finance gym? Um, well, so a little bit about the finance gym. It, this is a project that I have been working on and, and now have turned it into a startup to work with people that are sick and tired of living paycheck to paycheck and just can't quite get beyond the curve. Um, my belief why a lot of people can't get beyond that living paycheck to paycheck curve is they just don't spend enough time really focusing on their money. Um, and I came to that belief from kind of a financial disaster of my own. My background is I'm an, I'm an auditor. And I work for Cooper. I was an auditor. I worked for Coopers and Librand back in the day. Was a CFO of a fast growing nonprofit and. At the ripe young age of 30, thought I was all kind of hot stuff with money because of where I was in my career and went through a nasty divorce that was just financially devastating. And it um, took me a long time to figure out how to get out of that financial mess. Um, and one of the things that I realized in trying to dig myself out is that, wow, I graduated with an accounting degree, but never had any personal finance courses other than information on investing. I really didn't know anything about the other parts of personal finance. And so I spent a lot of time studying both that as well as the psychology of how we are with our money and you know, just the emotional impact and how that drives the decisions we make. Well, that's a that's a really powerful topic right there, the, the emotion behind how we deal with money and the stories that, that we have about money. Um, and I, th I think a lot of people assume we all see money similarly, but but I don't know that that's the case. I think I think it has different meaning to different people. One of the interesting things throughout my career, I, I opened a company called Creating Answers that's uh, still in existence. It's a chief financial officer firm. We mostly work with small business owners and not for profits, but also with um, people with their personal finances and. One of the things that I came to see there is that there's kind of a path people take. Like I, I noticed the clients I have that really, really were, were um, raised in poverty, they, they go in one of two directions. They kind of just keep that path for themselves or they go complete 180 degrees and make sure that a huge percentage of every piece of money they go gets put set aside into savings and reserves and they're just super frugal and super thoughtful and and I, I've seen the exact opposite with those that were raised fairly well to do you know it, it just seems a there's a, a path that we pick and I think that our background informs that path but it doesn't exactly shape that path when you say um, uh, it, it's the opposite for those that were raised with money. How, how do you mean? Well, I've seen a number of people who were raised fairly well to do and are very were very respectful of that. They were they were raised to appreciate it. Um, they were raised with some kind of education. You know, their parents really talked to them about money and honoring the money. Um, I have equally seen others who just ended up on the on a on a path of taking um, taking the money for granted mm -hmm. I uh, in at creating answers we ended up working with a lot of attorneys and you know attorneys 
often make really, really excellent money. I think this will speak to one of your points about home ownership. I had a, a couple come in once, both attorneys. They were both um, making six figures, you know, close to a quarter million dollars a piece. And they were locked into such an expensive home and such an expensive neighborhood. And both of them wanted to leave their careers. They wanted to scale back, but they couldn't because they'd made all of these locked in decisions, even with that amount of income, their children in private schools, this house that was more of a house than they really needed to spend, huge student loan debts that they were still digging their way out of, even though they were already starting to worry about their children's college education. Um, and they were clear that they had done it. And nonetheless, they, they, they kept, they kept doing it. I think we just, some of us just have to learn a lesson the hard way the before hard way. we start looking at our money differently. Let's let's continue with your story. I think I, I took you down a tangent. You um, were doing really well with your career, career, making a lot of money, had a difficult divorce, and that I think is you, you were giving the uh, the backstory to the finance gym. Yeah, and so what what happened for me? I was thirty years old when that happened, and I remember very clearly a friend of mine saying. Oh, Stacy, you know, in a couple of years, this is going to be all behind you and you're going to be in control of your own money and things are going to be so much better. And, you know, a year later, things weren't better. And two years later, things weren't better. And, you know, somewhere around the time three years came along and, and things still weren't better. That's when I realized, well, I'd been blaming the divorce. I'd been blaming, you know, what, what ended up being um, kind of a, well, I don't want to get into the story of it, but I'd been blaming that whole event instead of taking a look at my behavior and what I was doing. And what I was doing is every time there was an issue, I was jumping in with all of my knowledge and skill set and all that and fixing the problem, and then things would get good again for a while. And I wasn't addressing it at those times. And when when things are pretty good, when things are good with your money, that's when you kind of want to be out on Saturday riding on the bike trail or, you know, your kids' soccer games. But the truth is those are the times that you can make significant impact and forward motion on your money. Those are the times that we tend to not spend on them. And that's one of the big realizations that I came to. Um, the second big realization I came to is that I was a single mom at the time. I had no partner. I had nobody that I was having to look in the eye and talk about my money. Um, and I, I was, because I had, you know, been an, <laughs> been an auditor and a CFO of this big company, I was so ashamed I didn't want to talk to anyone. So I wasn't talking to anybody. And so that's one of the other things I think that made a big, huge difference for me is that I, I finally started reaching out, um, found somebody that would coach me around my money, um, and then ended up doing that my that work myself for, for others. That's when I changed what, by this point, I had my own accounting firm and changed the work that I was doing with my clients from spitting out reports to sitting people down and actually talking about what's in those financial reports. When you start talking to somebody and they're asking you specific questions about where your money is going and, and what choices you're making with your money, you begin to... I, I would assume, begin to feel accountable, even though they're not responsible for you, just having to explain it uh, when you know you should be doing different um, changes things. I think it's it's the accountability, and it's also just saying it out loud to another human being, saying what we walk around, because we don't, we don't talk about money, mm -hmm. we, but we do talk about it in our heads a lot every day. Oh, I shouldn't have stopped at Starbucks. Oh, I shouldn't have bought those six extra things at Target. Oh, I shouldn't have, you know, I don't really know if I had the money to go shopping at Nordstrom's. You know, we we talk about money in our heads all the time. We don't talk, we don't have meaningful conversations about it with other people very often. A couple or family is looking to make a home purchase, moving from 
uh, renting perhaps and and moving into buying a home. Um, how would you? How should they be talking about money uh, and this uh, large expense um, between themselves? So I think there's uh, a few things that I would recommend. One of the p- key uh, sources of advice or key points of advice that I give people is this thing I call date night with your money, especially if you're in a couple. But even if it's even if you're alone, I still tell people date night with your money at a minimum once a month. I think to, it would be best done a couple times a month where you are setting that time aside, getting out of your house, getting out you know, away from the kids, the laundry, the whatever is going to distract you, going somewhere kind of fun and sitting down and making plans about your money, um, figuring out what you're going to do for that month, that year, the next five years, laying that groundwork when you're trying to figure out simple little things like how are you going to pay for next summer's vacation? Just having those kinds of consistent conversations prepares you to have the conversation about, okay, we're going to go buy our first home. What is that going to mean? Um, the second thing that I recommend is budgeting. And, you know, I know people hear a lot of people hear that word budgeting and just want to put their head in this, in the sand. Um, I, even though I'm an accountant and of course, you know, I have 60 lines in my budget, I am a big proponent of there's nothing wrong with having a 10 line budget. You don't have to have this huge thing, but you need to sit down and just attempt to do some good enough numbers. Um, They don't have to be perfect numbers. They don't even have to be right, but you at least need to think about it. It's one of the things that I've, um, woven into the book that I wrote is giving people a simple format to figure out all the costs that come along with a home other than, of course, the ones you know about, the mortgage, interest, taxes, all that. And Um, let's let's talk about that. You get into that in your book and and raise some really uh, big ideas about those unexpected uh, costs of of a home. What what should people keep in mind uh, aside from the obvious expenses when they're when they're making a home purchase? Oh, my gosh. There's all kinds of stuff. It, it, it's so funny because I hear people uh, talk about how great it is to move into a brand new home because you don't have to fix anything. Well, the first home I bought was a brand new home. And, oh, my gosh, you can't believe how many new things, you know, how many things you need to buy in a, in a new home. And the list just keeps coming. Um, so I have all this list in my, in my book, you have to think about, of course, repairs and renovations of whatever home you're moving into, but appliances, additional furnishing, window coverings, landscaping, moving costs, um, any kind of utility activation fees, uh, anything that comes along. If you are in any kind of a, um, home owner community where you're going to have some kind of dues, uh, and it never, I mean, that's the stuff just from moving in. And then there is, of course, the roof, the plumbing, the, you know, the trees falling, the whatever. When you're a homeowner, it, the one thing that you can be sure of is something's going to happen with your home, usually at least once a year. And you need to have some money and, and anticipate having money for that. Yeah, otherwise you end up in this in this cycle. Certainly when the big crash came, um, I think what was so unfortunate for so many people is that they, it, before, when they needed to fix a huge plumbing problem or fix their roof, they they had plenty of home equity. So, you know, oh, well, it's, it's tax deductible. I'll just take out a home equity line and fix my roof. Except that just extends what was always supposed to be a 30-year, or if you're really smart, a 15-year obligation. Then it becomes a 35, 40, 45-year obligation. I have lots of people that have come to me and they're 
nearing their 60s and they still got 15 years to pay on their home. You know, and, and a lot of that is because people don't set aside that amount of money every month that they will absolutely have to spend on something. You don't know whether it's roof or painting or, you know, you don't know what's going to go wrong, but you do know something's going to go wrong. It's just, it's a home. Most people um, uh, go to a bank to find out how much they can afford, which is the wrong place. Um, uh, how would you advise somebody to figure out how much house, how much of a budget, and how large of a loan uh, they can afford when buying? Oh, that's a great question. And when I was looking at your website, I, I just loved you said something in, in there about the fact that a financial planner is an excellent place to go because what normally happens and the the financial people that somebody is most likely to speak to in their life is either their mortgage broker mortgage banker or their realtor and most mortgage bankers not all of them but most mortgage professionals and realtors have been taught that the best thing you can do is to get your client into as big a house as possible. You know, and for the bad ones, it's because they make more commission that way. But I, I think I know a ton of really good ones. And we'll sit and argue about this. They truly believe that that's what they should do because real estate's always going to go up in value and... So it's always good to get as much house as you possibly can. This is this is what my colleagues in the profession tell me. I completely disagree. I have seen the impacts that it has on so many people. And the, the truth is, having a home that suits your entire life needs, not just this year or the next five years, but the next 10, 20, 40 years is a far more important decision um so i recommend of course talking to a, a financial planner a certified financial planner um i think that that that's who is absolutely best qualified to take a look at your budget and have a meaningful conversation with you about what what that will look like going forward um and some people feel like they can't afford going to a good certified financial planner. That's a two, three, four thousand dollar commitment. Um, even just sitting down and doing that work before you pick up the phone and talk to your banker or talk to a realtor, I think even just doing that work on your own gets you much more set to then have a conversation and see where those numbers lie. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> you're talking about figuring out the the amount of home and look out 10, 20, 30 years. Um, I think there's also uh, this the variety of uh, parts of your life that are impacted by the home choice and and money being a big part of that, not the only part, but a big part. And and making that decision about how much you want to spend. And knowing that you have other things that are important too, and and what what happens when people are shopping for a home and they're in home shopping mode, is they'll find out how much they can afford or how much they can borrow, and work to a number, and that's a max. They just can't get more than that because the the bank isn't willing to lend more than that, and that's more than they should borrow. But uh, they may well a buyer may well try and tone that down, and will go look at some properties. But what happens is consistently, every time you look at a more expensive home, it's nicer. I mean, yeah. just you, you look at that $250,000 home, and it's kind of okay. And then you look at the $300,000 home, and that's much better. And then you go look at another 250000 and it's disappointing. And, and that is a hard thing uh, outside of the influence of, of the realtor and, and the lender. I think that is a real challenge for as someone buying a home to feel disappointed with what they're getting. Um, and when they're in house shopping mode, they're only thinking house. They're not thinking about uh, the impact the stress will cause on their marriage, on their family life, the free time to do things, money to 
to take the family on vacations. Um, do you have any? How would you guide somebody as a financial planner? How would you guide people into finding that balance? You know, that's such an interesting question, Bill. You know, because the obvious answer is to find a realtor who's only going to show you if your if your number is okay. I, I want a three hundred twenty five thousand dollar house. Do not show me anything but $325,000 houses. That's an obvious answer, but it doesn't happen that way. You and I, you know, you and I both know that. Anybody who's ever been home shopping knows that. You just can't help. It's fun going to look and see what's out there. It's fun for most of us. Um, And so I think people need to be really clear about that. And one of the things that I incorporate into my book is a lot of journaling and and thought questions about just what you've said. How is this going to impact my children's life? How is this going to impact my ability to take vacations? Are vacations important to me? You know, how stable is my job? Do I like taking care of, you know, a a $325,000 house is a lot different than taking care of a $400,000 house or even a $200,000 tiny home, you know? Um, so I, I think one of the things that I recommend would recommend is if journaling is something that works for you, sit down and journal, write about all those other things in the midst of home shopping. If you're buying it with your partner, have those conversations and talk about all the other things in your life. Um, And in a partnership, I think that it's quite frequent that people kind of fall on different sides. One person's kind of excited about having a home to take care of and all the expense, and the other person frequently is kind of the flip side of, but I want to go travel. I don't want to be tied down to a house every weekend. Do you think it's possible that, or likely that people would have the discipline uh, to say, "Don't, we're not going to go see anything that's listed for over three hundred twenty-five thousand, or some draw a line in the sand and not go past it." Is that is that practical? I think it's practical, and I think of all the realtors that I know, and they, you know, they're they all come from different walks of life and a couple of realtors that I, that I know are, um, they come from a more difficult financial upbringing and they're the first ones that I would send somebody that was in, in that situation where look, they really, you know, really can't go over 300,000, which can be tricky to find a $300,000 home right now. Um, I would, tend to send that person to one of those realtors because they would be completely respectful of that. And it doesn't mean that other realtors aren't respectful. I just think some people understand what that feels like and the ramifications more than others when they've been brought up that way. One thing I've noticed, now I'm a a broker and I've helped people buy and sell homes. I never played a huge role in the financial conversation, I didn't have access to their incomes uh, and and the, the money, the the financial side of their life. For the most part, that was dealt with with their lender, with the bank. And there's something um, flawed in that system, in my opinion. I, I don't know what the solution is, uh, aside from making sure people uh, get a better financial guidance, perhaps than. Than, than is normally available. A lender is calculating based on, they, they have a whole set of criteria. And so a good lender is using that set of criteria. A good lender is giving their client that information that says, you can, you know, you're approved for up to X amount of loan. And what a lot of people don't understand, they see that person as a financial professional. They don't understand that a lender saying that is very different. They're, they're coming at that amount very differently than a financial planner would come at that amount. Um, or 
it, it, you know, any different kind or a tax accountant. Like everybody has the, in the financial world, everyone has their own little area and a lender has a whole different set of calculations than a financial planner has. Financial planner is, of course, looking at your retirement, your kids' college education, your ability to set reserves aside, your ability to make sure you have enough money to live until you're 95, 100 years old. It's a whole different set of criteria. And most people, they don't understand that. We've, we've not taught that to people in the educational system. Do you, do you have any stories that you could share about how a home purchase affects a a marriage or a, a family's uh, relationship uh, to one another? I think that the one that I already shared is I often share that story because it's in, it's indicative to many of the stories that I've heard over the years that people feel so locked in to the housing choice that they made. But they're no longer spending the time that they want to with their children. They're just not able to because they need to continue working enough to support that house. Um, and I think that I've seen people attack that as a couple together and um, make decisions one way or the other. But I've, I've also seen it pit marriages uh, apart, really People end up on one side or the other, and certainly in the middle of the housing market collapse, that decision to let the house be foreclosed on or short sell really tore, I think, a lot of marriages apart. I know I I, I sat across the room from many a couple that were really struggling with that decision. I believe that when under that kind of financial pressure, if you stretch too far and you're feeling stuck um, and, and you came into this decision with different uh, objectives from different viewpoints, um, but agreeing on that one property and that one mortgage, um, as the pressure mounts, I've, I've seen it um, have really terrible impact on, on marriages. Well, I think it also has a big, huge impact on uh, self-esteem and then how how the impact that has on marriages. Because when the economy is tight like it was, not everybody is going to be able to maintain the same income level that they already had. And I, I know one couple that I can think of in particular, um, the, the husband lost his job and ended up working, you know, basically a retail job. And they didn't have the money to keep the house with that switch in income. Um, and it really, of course, impacted his self-esteem. It impacted their house and, and was very, very, they, they struggled for years trying to keep their marriage together and in the end didn't. You know, and, and who knows? There's probably many reasons why that happens, but you don't have to invite that one in. It certainly compounds any any difficulties by by getting in too deep on a house. Well, and and uh, for instance, I think a home purchase affects careers um, in in unexpected ways. For instance, your your story with the attorney couple that that got locked in and they wanted career change. They wanted to scale down their their professional lives and simply weren't able to do it. Do you? Can you think of any other examples of, of and I, I know this is, it, it's a way of looking at it that I don't think people do, so it may be coming out of left field for you, but anything occur to you like that story where home choice uh, affected someone's career options? Well, I think one of the most obvious ones is just being aware of the simple fact of how much money you can lose if you buy a home in a city and then suddenly you need to transfer to another city. And there is a wide range of um, how many years you, on average, need to live in a city before it is um, you've essentially made up the money of the cost of the purchase 
Because in New York, it's like you better stay. You better plan on staying in New York. It's something like nine, ten, eleven years. In Sacramento, I think it was three or four. You know, and it's, so it's. Well, it depends on what's happening in that local market, which um, generally real estate goes up um, long term. So, you know, over 100 years, it's it's gone up with inflation uh, and, of course, the, the changes in sizes and qualities that, that have evolved since then. But it doesn't necessarily – that's a Robert Schiller study um, talks about real estate really long term – uh, is simply growing in value at the rate of inflation, but but short term, the, the s- cycles of uh, up and down to the point they're they're pretty typically called booms and busts um, in housing values. And if you're on the wrong side of that, um, where prices have been dropping since you bought it, you're stuck. You're either going to either lose a lot of money if you add a lot of money down, or you're going to have to short sell or take a big loss. Yeah, well, and, and that actually brings to mind, you asked me this question earlier. So what would you recommend to somebody who's in the middle of making these decisions? Um, and so what comes to mind is go watch or even better read The Big Short because Michael Lewis did such a good job of explaining to lay people in in that book kind of what happens in in those booms and busts and how that happens. It was very pronounced. Um, I mean, there were some really different things going on in in this last go around, which is why it was so crazy. I mean, it, uh, it brought the world's economies on the brink of collapse. Was how it got characterized. I mean, that was uh, an extraordinary um, misuse of of money and power at a uh, just unbelievable scale. And uh, there's been a lot of unhappy people, you know. There are people who are still in homes. Uh, and you alluded to the fact that you, I think, encourage some people to short sell properties. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, me too. But, uh, I mean, someone who, who uh, you know, bought a 500000 and owns a property worth 250000 is unlikely to recover financially. They'll never be the same financially as where they could have been. And, and that's just so unfortunate. Well, and that's one of the one of the things I, I really encourage people to do, and one of the tenets for the work that I do is that I believe that we just don't sit down and calculate that math. So many of us grow up with this belief: I'm not good at math, and how can I do? It? Well, you, you know, it's it's just it's simple numbers, and yeah, it's going to take you a little while. But that's what I did with a number of my clients. Is and I'm not a financial planner. So I'm not putting the I wasn't putting this information in a big huge you know piece of of uh, advanced financial calculation. We were just simply doing doing the math, and simple math showed those people that they were going to be far better off if they just walked away from their house or did a short sale. Six about six months ago, I, I went around Elk Grove. Um, and took a look at properties that sold in 2006 and then again in 2016 and compared their selling prices for the same property uh, 10 years later. And um, it was back to, on average, 83% of the 2006 prices. Yes. If you look at those points in time of 2006 to 2016, you are absolutely right. But what you said earlier, and this is what I I think people really need to understand, is that the real estate market is just like tides going in and out. We can't calculate it like we can the tides, but what we know from history is that the tides will always go in and out. And if if you built too close, you know, too close to that line and the tide goes out and you don't have reserves and you don't have a backup and just a couple little things go wrong, you're the one that loses. You know, that's the, the people with lots of reserves, the people who bought less of a house, the people with um, family that can sustain them over time um, or something to support them. They're going to be okay. That's that's who was okay, uh, and 
though I think we'll probably never see, I mean, who knows, but we'll probably never see what happened happen to that extent in our lifetime. But we will absolutely see it happen again, just to a lesser extent. Let me get your opinion on down payments. Um, you, you can get an FHA loan with um, a 3.5% down payment, a very low down payment. Um, and young home buyers are, and young families who don't have a lot of cash saved are, are, are using that as a way to get into a house sooner. And the argument for it is it allows people who wouldn't otherwise be able to buy a house buy a home what are your thoughts on having a a down payment that small i see both sides of the fence on that um because what i was just talking about buying too close to the line and then the tide goes out meaning uh you buy too close to the line and all of a sudden uh Something happens, you know, your roof needs to be replaced, and that's a $15,000 repair. Somebody who bought that close to the line doesn't have access to $15,000 to repair their roof, nor do they have equity in their home to take a line out to fix that roof. Or if they lose their job, and all of a sudden, they don't have any way to support that. So I think that there's I think there's huge risks in doing that. Um, that said, I'm a um, very interested in poverty alleviation. And for a lot of people, being in a home, the, the difference between living in poverty and starting to lift yourself out of poverty is becoming a home, homeowner. And for those people, it's not realistic to say, put 20% down. Um so I see both sides. I think if there's any way at all possible to put at least 10%, 15% down, I think that that should be done. I think it should be scrambled. You'd be much, much better off even just having that money set aside somewhere. Because once you're in that house, um, it gets a lot harder to put money away. But But I think there are realities and every situation is different. And if it's your only way to get in a house and you really want to be in a house, then I think it's good that we have programs that support the ability to do that. The story uh, that I put in my book that I love to share, it's um, actually one of my best friends. She bought her house when she was in her um, mid-20s, early to mid-20s. And she bought right to that line. Um, of course, this was back in a time when you couldn't get those three to five percent FHA loans, so she did put more down. But she, she it was something like fifty five percent of her income every month was going to this house, and she struggled for, you know, throughout her entire twenties, she struggled. The the difference and why I point that out was that she made that choice. All her friends were spending their money on new cars or trips and vacations. She wanted to be a homeowner. And so she went through that pain in in a very intentional and mindful way. And now she's on the other side of that. She's going to have her house completely paid off by the time she's 55 years old. And so it's been able to afford her a whole lot more mobility in her career decisions and the jobs that she's chosen um, so there is there is both sides to that. It's not that it's never a good idea. I think you just have to be really clear about it. Do Do you have a percentage? Uh, and I do you have an opinion on how much someone should spend? This affordability uh, question it, as a percent of income. That's how banks will will do it, but but they tend to do it on the high end. What would your opinion be for? Uh, an affordable choice uh, in general terms? So for somebody at middle income levels or even, you know, uh, lower uh, upper income levels, but, but, you know, so say low, low six figures, right at the six figure mark. um, I am a huge proponent of looking at the 25% area. And I know that is far lower. You know, it used to be that that banks would look at 
36% of your mortgage interest tax. Uh, and then when they looked at all your other debt, they'd bring you up to 47%. They changed that rule. You, you can probably quote how long ago, but it was just a few years ago. They changed that rule and made it more. So they'll let you take more debt. When you, one of the pictures I have in my book actually chunks up a dollar bill. And so when you sit and look at all the things we have to spend money on in our life, including our retirement, it, it really makes it hard to pencil out anything much above 25%. And that's um, 25% for principal interest, taxes, and insurance, just house-specific costs, perhaps and yep. homeowners association if there, there's a, a regular fee. Right. Okay. And so if you're doing 25%, that really becomes, when you look at all of the other costs of owning a home, on average, you're going to have to bump that out up about 6%. So that will become 31% of your monthly gross income is going to be going towards your house when you look at it over time. Good. I think that's a, a good number to help people and do their own math, and, and at least just as, as a guideline, because it's very easy to take the bank's number uh, when they say, you know, 36, we can do that, and assume someone has done some math for you saying that you can afford that. That would be an okay lifestyle, and, and no one's actually done that math. They're just doing bank math, which is it's we'll lend that amount, we can get insurance in case you fail. And, and by the way, if it's an FHA, you'll pay for that insurance. So. Right, right. And if you love to pack your lunch every day, eat at home all the time, not take a, any kind of significant vacations, not put money away for your kid's college, absolutely, you know, go take out 40% for a house. But, you know, the, the, you're the one that has to make that math work every single month. And that has to be a, a, a choice. You have to know you're going to be taking your lunch and you won't be saving for the college education uh, at certain dollar levels, you just you have to decide if that's really what's most valuable to you. And and um, um, it's interesting this whole dream home uh, expression of people wanting, and young families are just wanting the nicest house they can afford, and it's not thought through at that kind of detail, and it really does need to be. So the whole thing about. Owning a home is an American dream and the tax write-off and all that. If you read back into the policy decisions, be just a little bit of a policy wonk here, that came out of the Great Depression. That was all implemented in a time when the government was trying to infuse uh, some robustness in the construction and real estate market to get people back to work, to really grow our economy, which is great, Ab absolutely great. It was really important at the time. and But but I think what people see is that they, they, they are led to believe that home ownership is the only way to become wealthy, that that is. That is something that our tax code has perpetuated that myth. Um, and then the real estate industry, the mortgage industry, the whole financial services industry perpetuates that through their marketing. It is how they make money. So what I always tell people is, if you want to be a homeowner, go be a homeowner, absolutely. But don't go be a homeowner because you think you're gonna save so much money on your taxes or because you think somehow you're gonna become wealthy because you own this home. It's your home, it's not an investment. Now, if you buy a bunch of properties and rent them out, that is absolutely a great way, if you like to do that, a great way to become wealthy. But your home is not an investment. It's the place you live. That's interesting. I've, <clears throat> that, that seems to be a debate, that, that use of the word investment. And, and it really depends on how you want to define investment. Um, and, it, you know, Apple... Uh, computer is, uh, or just Apple, I guess, is is not the same company it was 20 years ago. But that that house is pretty much the same house it was 20 years ago. It's it's not growing into something more valuable. Its utility isn't changing. It's a single family home, but but there is a financial component, 
and that's where I think it, it gets complicated. And I would like your opinion. Is there um, a retirement, a financial component that does have an investment-like quality, not to you know lose it in the in the definition of investment long term if people stay in their home um that that can be or should be counted towards a, a retirement so yes if done the way that it was originally meant to be meaning if you buy a home when you're 25 to 30 years old if you take out no more than a 30-year mortgage, so you're paying it off by the time you're 55 to 60 and still working, Um, and don't take out second mortgages and don't extend the life and don't refinance. All the things that we all see our friends, our colleagues, or we have done that extend it beyond our working years. So the the benefit to the retirement, if you do it the way it was supposed to be done, is, of course, then you're locked in. You don't have a mortgage payment. All you have to take care of is the property taxes and the general upkeep. Then it's a, a huge benefit to your retirement years because you are locked in at a really low shelter cost and you're not at the whims of the rental market. Um, I know I have... Uh, have had a client who like her her plan her kids are all good they don't need any inheritance she doesn't have much but she does have her house and so her backup plan is a reverse mortgage you know and and that that's not optimal but it's certainly an option right so for her that house has been used as an investment um however that's not how a lot of people treat their home no. You know what, how they how how it tends to get treated is I want to put a pool in or wow I'm gonna I'm gonna drop my interest rate from four percent to two point eight percent and and oh extend my mortgage another seven years beyond right. what it was supposed to be and and then it's then it becomes less of an investment and just more of a shackling. Tell us tell tell me a little bit about your book. Oh, so it is called the Finance Gym Action Plan for a Better Life with Money. Um, it's a it's a workbook it has a lot of stories woven into it, and it's written from the perspective of I kind of walk through much of what I personally walked through in trying to fix my own financial life. So everything from, of course, the budgeting stuff because I'm an accountant, but But more importantly, um, how to set up better systems around saving so that you can and and how you start saving if you've never saved before. You know, how on earth, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, do you even start saving money? And so I talk a lot about that. I talk about what it takes to dig yourself out of debt over time. Um, And I talk a lot about our relationship with money and why we make the decisions we do. There's a lot of places in here for um, people to just put pencil to paper and write about how they feel, which I think motivates people to do better with their money much more than just sitting down and writing some numbers and a budget out. It's um, I think we're much more motivated by our, by our feelings than just looking at some number on the page. So it's um, it's light. It's creative. Uh, anybody who my my best friend who would never pick up a money book calls it it's the money book for people who wouldn't normally want to open a money book. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and and people could find it on your website or they can find it on my website thefinancegym.com and you can also find it on Amazon just by googling um, finance gym or money or Stacy Powell. Great. Stacy, thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate it. You're welcome. It was great to talk to you, Bill. Thanks for joining us on the Surviving the American Dream podcast. If you found this helpful, please leave a comment and share with your friends or family, and especially anyone looking to make their home happier.